so much for tuning into the Swam Podcast, where we educate, empower, and evolve the people. Today is our very first episode, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here recording this episode today. I'm very grateful for every ear that hears this, and I just want to let you know that you've already made a huge, huge decision that your future self is going to thank you for just by listening in. Today's topic is going to be trauma, and we will be discussing what is trauma, what are some of the symptoms that you have if you've experienced trauma, which ways you can um, deal with it, and how it may be affecting your everyday life. Most importantly, we will be giving you some tips and how to know when to see a professional. So let's get into it. So thank you again for tuning in today. If you're listening to this episode, then you may or may not be familiar with the term trauma. One thing is I've noticed that the word trauma is being thrown around just like willy nilly, like it's nothing. And people are labeling trauma and maybe mislabeling trauma. So the first thing that I like to do is to educate people. It's time to educate my swans because we only speak facts. We don't want to be like anybody else that's online that's just talking just to be talking or just speaking about random things because it's their opinion or because they have a platform. Platform. I really love to research, so I pride myself on getting down to the nitty gritty, you know, speaking of facts. So what is trauma? So I did a little bit of research and I didn't want to just get any definition. So this ain't no Wikipedia definition. This is according to the American Psychological Association or the APA. So the APA defines trauma as an emotional response to a terrible, terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. Reactions such as shock and denial are typical and longer term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms. I know for myself personally, I did not realize that I was experiencing trauma or that I had had a bunch of trauma actually in my life that stemmed from childhood that was piling up and piling up and piling up and showing itself up in different parts of my life, whether it be my relationships, whether it be my jobs, my interactions with other people, how I was reacting to my children when they would misbehave. So I started to notice that I was hella sad. I mean, just waking up with an overall depressed, emotional feeling. And I'll never forget, I used to cry a lot. You know, um, I used to dwell on the past and I used to think about a lot of things that had happened to me in my life. And I used to just always feel like, why me? Why did I have that childhood? Or why did I have those experiences? And it was very hard for me to cope with, to be honest. Um, I didn't know that I had experienced trauma. I didn't have the word or the verbiage or the actual term trauma in the forefront of my mind. I just knew I didn't really want to feel like that anymore. So that's why I started the first episode with trauma, because I think trauma is the seed and the foundation of a lot of our negative emotions that we carry with us on a day-to-day basis. And if you are normally having negative emotions, whether it be sadness, irritability, anger, um, it came from somewhere. I like to always say we are born pure. We are not born with trauma. You know, sometimes there's research that shows that there could be trauma experienced by the mom in which some of those emotional responses that she had are transmuted into the womb and into the baby. So I'm not saying you can't be born with trauma, but most of our trauma that takes place in our lives um, usually gets imprinted as we start to go through life and have experiences through childhood and adolescence. And it makes us who we are today. So you could be walking around some huge trauma bomb, not even realizing why everything ticks you off, you're irritated or you're emotionally triggered meaning a negative emotion comes back to the surface um, and you don't know why. You just think it's something normal because you've lived with the trauma and the emotional residue for so long. So some of my experiences that I've had with trauma are have been um, growing up in poverty. Um, when you're raised in poverty, 
you see a lot of things and it goes in you know you we ignore those things a lot of times sometimes not having groceries not having enough money not having a car being in public transportation it actually exposes your senses to things that everybody's not um exposed to that aren't really that present um pleasant excuse me so um, if you've been raised in a low socioeconomic environment, meaning you had less access to resources, you had less access to nutritious foods, you had less access to daily activities, sunlight, things that we know now contribute to health, um, you may have been traumatized through those experiences. And if the adults around you, especially if you were a child, were subject to those experiences too, they may have been emotionally, physically, or verbally abusive to you because of the conditions that you were lived in. So if you lived in the ghetto like me and you grew up in the hood, I mean, we grew up in the projects. Um, nine times out of 10, you were exposed to that. And I'm, I'm gonna get into some of the statistics of how trauma affects minorities opposed to non-minorities um, in just a bit. But um, some other experiences that we could call traumatic would be um, being exposed to violence. If you grew up in a household where um, your parents or your siblings or your family members were violent, um, or if they were verbally or emotionally abusive to you, um, another traumatic experience can be at a work environment. If when you go to work, your coworkers aren't friendly, or if you have a boss that's a bully, or if you have a stressful work environment, because I think people don't realize that little stressors add up and really can shock your immune system and release stress hormones that will definitely play a role in your emotional well-being. Um, so every day in life, you might be experiencing some, experiencing some trauma and not recognizing it as trauma. Certain things such as, like I said, relationships, um, family relationships, challenges in your job and career, financial hardships, and much more can actually be considered as trauma, along with the bigger things like death, um, losing a child. Um, I know I had some challenges with miss. I had a miscarriage before I had my first son, and I remember that I buried that a little bit, just being young and not knowing how to cope and feel the emotions and just kind of hiding within that hurt and that pain and never expressing myself and moving on and also thinking that it was a badge of honor to not actually acknowledge those emotions and take some time and sit with them and grieve. So um, I'm gonna share with you some signs that you may have some emotional residue that is tied to some trauma. And these are also according to the APA these are not my personal opinions, and this is not to um, replace seeing an actual therapist or a certified professional to get help if you feel that you need it. Um, so one sign or symptom that you may have experienced trauma in your life is that you have intense or unpredictable feelings. You might get anxious, nervous, overwhelmed, or even grief-stricken, and you might feel more irritable or moody. Now, I know a lot of people that label themselves as always irritated and always annoyed or always agitated, and they don't see that as an issue. They just see that as having a rough day. But if nine times out of 10, if your mood is always to be irritated or anxious or nervous or worried, that is a sign or a symptom that you may have experienced something that traumatized you in the past and now your nervous system and your memories, your mind, is, it actually thinks that it's protecting you by bringing up feelings to warn you that, hey, you are in danger again when you in fact aren't. So um, I'll give you an example. I remember when I used to get nervous when I would go grocery shopping. Now, a lot of people might laugh and think that this is something that is just like, oh my God, how could you be nervous from going grocery shopping? But there were times as a single mother when I was young and I didn't know how I was going to put food on the table or I went to the grocery store with not really enough money to buy an abundance of food. So when I would start pulling up to the grocery store, I would start to feel a little butterflies in my stomach or nervousness. And I would notice that my breathing would change because I would start to get nervous of 
I hope I will have that emotional feeling of I hope I have enough to get enough to feed my children. And then and the fear that I was facing was that I wasn't going to be able to take care of them, which is a very scary feeling for a mom. So if you have mothers out there that are single parents then and experiencing financial hardships, that can be traumatizing. So it's important that we recognize that and acknowledge that. And it's important that you know that you're not alone. So if you start to have intense or unpredictable feelings all the time and you feel like your moods are all over the place, that could be a key sign that something is going on under the surface. Another, um, another sign or symptom that you may have experienced some trauma that you need to work through is that you have changes to your thoughts and behavior patterns. Now, this is very important because so many people have may have had this change and shifted into a deep negative thought pattern without noticing, and you might have been in that negative thought pattern for years. So if you've been caught in that thought pattern, you may have never even seen when you shifted from unhappy to, from happy, excuse me, to ha unhappy, or from happy all the time and cheerful about things to sad. You know, it might be a transition that you never noticed, but um, you ha might have repeated vivid memories of a traumatic event. So it starts to shift your pattern of behaviors where you don't want to do the things that you normally would do, or you just don't feel motivated anymore, and you just recognize that you're not yourself. And um, an important point to bring out with this is that you have to be aware. And I like to define awareness as uh, shining a light on something that is once dim, meaning you weren't paying attention to it. And when you start to pay attention to, hey, you know what? I don't feel as happy as I could possibly feel. I don't feel as happy as I used to feel. It's time to start taking a look at what's going on in your life and seeing what happened and where did those changes start to occur? When did you start to feel differently? Um, so sleeping and eating patterns might change or be disrupted. I know before I started to go into therapy, one thing that I noticed was that I was not able to sleep through the night. Um, I was very traumatized. I had experienced prior to going to therapy, my brother um, dying of a vicious murder. My landlord in the building that I lived in had fell from his top porch and died. A neighbor of mine when I lived in New York was murdered by her husband and so many other things had happened just to name a few and I buried it for a long time until I started to notice that hey you know when I lay down to go to sleep at night I'm popping up at three four o'clock in the morning you know um, I can't sleep I'm restless um, I'm waking up having bad dreams. So my sleeping patterns start, started to change, even though my day-to-day -day life patterns, it wasn't noticeable, but I did notice, hey, I'm not able to make it through the night. Um, or sometimes, I, you know, people that may become depressed could be sleeping a lot. So it's important to pay attention to if your appetite changes, if you lose your appetite, or even if you start to overeat and you've never overeaten before, to notice where that might be coming from. Um, another sign or symptom that you might be dealing with some trauma is that you have a sensitivity to emotional factors like sirens, loud noise, burning smells, or anything that's in your environment that can go into your sensory that would trigger um, a past trauma. So for me, um, which is really interesting, is after my brother was murdered, I could not watch violence on TV. Um, I remember watching Sons of Anarchy and it was so violent people were constantly getting shot at people were getting hit people were it was all types of stuff going on and i remember just knowing to myself like this is very hard for me to watch being that my brother was shot in the head for me to be able to watch a tv show where people getting their brains blown off was very triggering to me to where i couldn't watch those type of shows because i still had an emotional connection to the sound of a gunshot even though i didn't physically um, I wasn't physically there when he was murdered. I didn't hear the shots, but it was traumatic to me. Um, those might, those triggers might be associated with whatever that stressful event is and your mind might feel like the stressful event is about to happen again or is that um, 
your mind might feel like it needs to protect you. So it's jumping into a uh, fight or flight mode, which is not necessary because you're just watching TV. Um, another way that you will see um, changes in your life is through strained interpersonal relationships. If you, and this takes a lot of honesty to be completely real. If you notice that you don't get along with nobody in your life, or you constantly have disagreements, challenges, arguments with people for no apparent reason, um, an increased conflict, disagreements with anybody, family members, coworkers. If you notice you just can't get along with anybody, um, you might start to become withdrawn or isolate, isolated or disengaged and even not even want to go to social events because of this. And it really has a lot to do with what I said before, which is your overall irritability, your overall mood. Um, you're not, you might not even know you're the negative vibe because you're not a pleasure to be around because you don't have a healthy emotional balance and that will start to reflect in your closest relationships. I always say that um, most people like being single because being in a relationship is literally holding a mirror to some of these things that you are going on, um, that are going on in your life emotionally. So very important to see how healthy um, are your relationships around you. Um, it's a key, key aspect in what you're dealing with if you're holding on to some trauma from the past it could be showing up in your day-to-day -day relationships which is not fair to you and it's also not fair to people that are in your lives that love you um another another sign or symptom is physical things um such as headaches nausea chest pains muscle tightness those things could that may or may not require medical attention but they are being exacerbated by your stress. They are being exacerbated by you not being able to relax and be at peace because of some of your emotional, I, I like to call it baggage, you know, things that you have not let go of. So those are some signs and um, symptoms, according to the APA, that you might have some trauma that is causing emotional issues in your day-to-day -day life. So we're moving on to the next topic is what I like to call swan statistics. Whenever I talk about a topic, you know, I like to go to the numbers and I pick one particular study to look at because I am an African American woman, as you can tell, and I always find it very important to see where these um where these statistics fall when it comes to how anything that has to do with mental, physical, emotional health and well-being affects us as minorities, not just black women, but people that represent um, those of us in the world that often get hit the hardest when it comes to these. And the facts that I found were pretty interesting um, and not exactly what I expected to find. So the correlations for African-Americans specifically is that we tend to have more exposure to violence, poverty, and other challenges. And this was my theory and my assumption, but that's not necessarily true. According to a study from the National Library of Medicine and the National Institution of Health, um, Blacks don't necessarily have more trauma than other races, which is interesting. Um, this study was performed in order to identify sources of racial and ethnic differences related to PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. We compared, well, they compared trauma exposure, risk for PTSD amongst those who are exposed to trauma and those who seek treatment. So what they did was they took interviews from um, 653 adults who responded, and this took place in the year of, uh, between 2004 and 2005. Um, they, they were trying to get to the bottom of a national epidemic on alcohol, alcoholism and related conditions, which we know many people from the community self-medicate their trauma with alcohol abuse and drug abuse. So this study's uh, purpose was to get to the bottom of that and to see if there were racial and ethnic um, importances that, that attributed to um, alcoholism and other things of that nature. So here's the facts, guys. The lifetime prevalence of PTSD was the highest amongst Blacks, meaning 
Black people have PTSD or post-traumatic stress syndrome most of their lives. It was intermediate amongst Hispanics and whites, um, ranging from 7 to 7.4 percent. It was 8.7 percent for Blacks. And it was lowest amongst Asians. Now, we're just talking about people that had PTSD the longest in their life. There were differences in risk for trauma. And that varied based on the types of events because we all know that traumatic events are different for people. You know, if you come from a wealthy environment, maybe it's traumatic that your parents get divorced or that you lose a, a portion of your income. But if you come from a lower socioeconomic status, your trauma might be every day you don't know what you're gonna eat. So um, the study showed that whites were more likely than other groups to have trauma. Okay, let me just repeat that. White people were more likely than any other group to have any trauma, to learn of a trauma of someone close and to learn of an unexpected death. Okay, so whites are leading in the trauma field, but blacks and Hispanics had a higher risk of child maltreatment, chiefly witnessing domestic violence and being a part of domestic violence. So let's take a look at that because when we talk about privileged upbringings and when we talk about the difference between um, how you survive in your adulthood and why that is, um, we can get into blacks spanking their children or being in domestic violence relationships and we can see that blacks obviously had longer exposure to trauma because theirs were more prevalent in childhood, which is very important to take note of. And maybe some whites, even though having more trauma overall, more being more exposed to trauma overall, it didn't start at such a young age as it did for blacks and Hispanics. Also, Asians, black men, and Hispanic women had a higher um had a higher risk of war-related events than whites. So that's important to point out. Amongst those exposed to trauma, PTSD risk was slightly hung higher amongst Blacks and lower amongst Asians compared to whites. And this is according to adjustments of characteristics after the trauma. So what they found was all minority groups, including African Americans and Hispanics were most were least likely to seek treatment for their PTSD and for their trauma. And fewer than half of the minorities sought treatment at all. So when it came down to it, whites were more likely to get treatment and had not been exposed to it as long. So even though at some point in a lot in their the life of a white person they would be way more likely than any other group to be exposed to trauma. They were also more likely to get treatment and less likely to be exposed to trauma in childhood, as opposed to Blacks and Hispanics who were exposed at an early age for a longer duration of time and decided not to go get treatment. And that was staggering. The uh, actual study concluded that when PTSD affects racial ethnicities and minorities is usually untreated and large disparities in treatment indicate a need for an investment in accessible and cultural culturally sensitive treatment options which is another point you know even with my therapist it was very important that i found another african-american woman that i could relate to and that could be culturally sensitive to me being a black woman so i hope that those statistics move you enough to, if you are in that racial group or if you are a minority, to actually seek some help. So here are some tips, because I don't wanna leave you with all of the negative statistics without telling you what you can do to make your life better. So one thing that you can do is communicate your experience. I can't tell you enough how often people keep everything bottled in, thinking that that is some sort of armor or strength to show that you have resilience to make it through anything. And baby, let me tell you, that is not the way. Expressing what you feel, owning your emotions, and knowing that your emotions are valid is so, so important. And once again, these tips are from the APA, but I can second them because I had to learn that 
what I feel is real. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's wrong if it's a negative emotion, but actually communicating it, expressing it and letting it out helps it to not come up again in the future. Talking with someone close, a family member, someone you trust that won't judge you, and also keeping a diary or a journal really helps to release some of those negative emotions. Also, you can find a local support group led by a trained professional that can help you to find other people that you can relate to. So at least you know, hey, I'm not alone in this. And it's not always healthy to dump your emotional things onto your friends and people that may not be emotionally equipped or that may be triggered because they have had emotional trauma themselves and they just don't want to be your shoulder to lean on. Another tip is to engage in some healthy behaviors. Um, if you don't, if you have a lot of excessive stress in your life, things like eating a well-balanced meal, getting up early, getting plenty of rest, meditating, going on walks, doing things like that when you feel stressed and recognizing when you're stressed and you need a break would definitely help that stress to not build up and to help you to not be triggered and turn to any negative coping mechanisms to get through. Um, you don't want to numb things with drugs and alcohol. Me, like everybody else, I like to turn up, but I want my turn up to be out of fun, not out of numbing PTSD or any trauma-ridden emotions. Establishing a routine. This can include eating meals at regular times, getting up at the same time, sleeping, waking, just getting your body on a good cycle so you can be calm and not feel overwhelmed goes a long way. Build positive routines and do things that make you happy first. If listening to music sets your mood for the right tone, get up and listen to music in the morning. There is nothing that says you have to get up and run out the door, right to work or right to some sort of stress-induced activity without loving yourself and being kind and gentle and compassionate to yourself first. So you might want to, you might be a little confused and you might not be really understanding, hey, is what I'm feeling normal? Am I just sad? Or do I need to seek a therapist? And I always say it's not really fair to always just tell somebody you need to go to therapy. I am not a therapist. I do not have a degree in psychology or neuroscience. So I'm going to give you some tips from the APA that tells you when to seek professional help. Um, when you start to feel like your negative emotions are overwhelming and that your day-to-day -day life every day is overall sad, that is a big sign that maybe you might want to talk to somebody. It's normal for some of us to feel sad from time to time, but if you're waking up every day feeling sad, feeling stressed, feeling unhappy, and you don't know what to do about it, it won't hurt to get a consultation. Even if there isn't anything wrong, even if you don't have a diagnosis, it never hurts to talk to a professional. And if you feel like you can't do it on your own, or you can't do it through watching motivational videos, listening to podcasts like The Swan, or reading books and journaling, some things that you can do on your own. Sometimes it is time to bring in a professional that can help you and you're not a weaker person for doing that. You are actually a stronger person for reaching out and being courageous enough to say, hey, I can't do this on my own and I need someone that is actually um, specialized in this topic that can help me. And also finding friends that have experienced it too and that are honest about their experiences. I know many of my friends, we talk about our struggles with anxiety, depression, and um, different things that we go through. And it really makes it um, really easier to have those healthy friendships where you can be transparent, honest, and to talk to people that are going to be honest with you too, to say, hey, you know, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm listening to you. But you also can talk to somebody and um, maybe get some further help. And if somebody tells you that you need therapy, don't jump down their throat and always get mad at them. If they're telling you that, it's probably because they really love you and they want to see you be a happier version of yourself. So I am going to drop my weekly, we will be dropping a Swan Life Changer book. And this is one of the first books that I read before I went to therapy or anything. I've shared it many times on my social media. So if you've been following me, sorry for the redundancy. This book is just the shit. 
It is called, it is by Eckhart Tolle. It's called The Power of Now. This book is really helpful because this book actually helps you to, number one, become a fly on the wall to your thoughts. Remember I talked about that awareness? Um, the Power of Now helps you to keep yourself present on the present moment. And when you do have trauma, sometimes you can keep yourself in the past. And it's okay to look back, but we don't want to stay there. We want to let it go and move forward. And we also want to bring ourselves to the awareness that we are not our thoughts. Sometimes we become so attached to our thoughts and our beliefs and the voice that's in our head that we don't realize that that's not who we truly are and that we can focus on other things like the present moment and like being grateful for the moment that you have instead of being so focused on the past. Um, I'm gonna read a quote from um, the Power of Now workbook where Eckhart Tolle is giving you a little bit of advice on how to keep yourself away from the negative emotions. He says, recurring negative emotions do sometimes contain a message as do illnesses, but any changes that you make, whether they have to do with your work, your relationships, or your surroundings are ultimately only cosmetic unless they arise out of a change in your level of consciousness. And as far as that is concerned, it can only mean one thing, becoming more present. When you have reached a certain degree of presence, you don't need negativity anymore to tell you what is needed in your life situation. But as long as negativity is there, use it. Use it as a kind of signal that reminds you to be more present. Whenever you feel negativity arising within you, whether caused by an external factor, a thought, or even nothing in particular that you're aware of, look on it as a voice saying, attention, here and now, wake up, get out of your mind, be present. I love that. So I hope those tips helped you today. The ADA also has a um, directory of therapists that you can find. I always suggest going to your insurance provider first and looking through their database or even giving them a call to find what therapists accept your insurance because a lot of them do. Looking at therapists in your area with a quick Google search to find what therapists take clients on a sliding scale scale, meaning that they go by your income, and then taking those therapists and looking them up on Psychology Today to look at their biology, that's psychologytoday.com, and just to get a little bit more research so that you can find a therapist that matches if you do feel that therapy is something that you want to give a try. I want to thank you again for listening, and if you know someone that is struggling with trauma or that has been through trauma, please share this episode with them. I'm going to close with a quote that I wrote and it says, the interesting thing about a swan is that when it hatches, it already knows how to fly, but it stays close to its parent until they both are comfortable enough to release all fears so that the swan can soar. You were born with the knowledge and the talent to fly. Release all fear and resistance, whether it be from yourself or your peers or your upbringing or your past experiences. You've always been a swan. It's time to wake up and realize it, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to the first episode. I'm so excited to bring you guys more. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and follow us on all our social media platforms at The Swan Podcast and The Real Ashley Watkins. Thanks, guys.